with the exception of Gedlin's meteoric rise to all-star status, Buckner's strong play, another batting title for Boggs, and Dennis Boyd's excellent season, the pundits would note the entire Red Sox year as only completely frustrating. As the team fell from contention at the all-star break to nearly 20 games back by the final day of play. Battered with injuries, perennial superstar Jim Rice said only the fans deserve better. With 191 days until the start of a new season, it was to be, as Charles Dickens wrote, the winter of despair. The Sox gathered for the 1986 season and spring training at Winter Haven, Florida in the fading days of February. Veterans like Rice, Tony Armas, Roger Clemens, and Al Nipper were once again healthy after a winter's rest. And there were new players added to the roster. The Sox swapped designated hitters with the Yankees. Mike Easler for Don Baylor. They traded Jackie Gutierrez to Baltimore for right-handed pitcher Sammy Stewart. For infield depth, Ed Romero came over from Milwaukee for pitcher Mark Clear. In a multiplayer deal, the Sox got Giraldi and Gartner from the Mets for Ojeda. And they picked up veteran left-hander Joe Sambito as a free agent after his release from the Mets. In all, as always, it was the spring of hope for fans, for players, and for second-year manager, John McNamara. The pitching, to me, is a name in the game. Uh, we had starters that I felt that had enough experience to, uh, to compete, and I felt that our pitching, uh, if it were consistent, and the bullpen did their job, that we had a chance to be very competitive and to win. It was a cold day in Motor City as the Red Sox faced Detroit in a season's opener on April 7th. 14-year veteran and 1985 game-winning RBI leader, Dwight Evans led off the game and the season as no one ever had. Left center and gone! Home run, Dwight Evans! My goodness! Evans comes across hitting the first pitch of the season 400 feet away. Mercy! Mercy indeed. And there were long ball shots by Jim Rice, Don Baylor, and Rich Gedman. Unfortunately, Tiger Kirk Gibson matched the effort in the fifth against starter Bruce Hurst, and then later against reliever Sammy Stewart. Six to five, the Tigers won. The Sox lost the first game of the 1986 season. Boston returned to Fenway Park for the home opener a week later against the world champion Kansas City Royals. The hometown team scored first in the first. And then again in the fifth with a homer by Marty Barrett. Marty Barrett with a high drive to left field. Laura Law will turn and it's off the upright home run Barrett. But it was not enough as starter Dennis Boyd faced the wrath of the Royals in the eighth. Laced into right center field toward the gap. Ripped off the glove of Boggs down to the corner. And now it is a 4-2 to game. And there it was, another loss. By April 16th, with the season less than 10 days old, the Sox were in dead last place, three and a half games out. It wasn't a time for panic, but it was a time for concern. By April's end, the situation had improved, but Boston was still two and a half games out with a record of 11 and eight. But the Sox had another record in April, one that was far and away more impressive. It was against the Seattle Mariners at Fenway. Roger Clemens was on the mound, 
And that night, April 29th, Roger was on his game like never before. And strike three. Clemens closed out April, leading the league with a record of four and zero. May was a month of mayhem for the Sox. They played 28 games in 31 days and won 21, outscoring the opposition by 50 runs, including a 17-run free-for-all against Minnesota on May 20th. High and hard to right field. Bruno going back, can't get it. Boggs will rip it up the middle for his fifth hit. One run scores, two run score. The word was out. The Red Sox were red hot. Five times Boston won games in their last at-bats. Marty Barrett had a 14-game hit streak. Home run hitter Jim Rice had become hit all fields, Jim Rice. And twice, Wade Boggs had five hit games, plus his first Major League Grand Slam. And as hot as the hitters were, Boston's big three men on the mound were just as imposing. Oil can boy, after a slow start in April, was five and one for May. Clemens, well, Roger was Roger, as he continued winning with a five and zero mark for the month and a season total of nine wins against no losses. And dependable Bruce Hurst had five victories over one defeat for the season's second month. Strike three, he caught Not to be outdone, the bullpen was bullish with the rejuvenated Joe Sambito a stalwart Sammy Stewart, and perennial workhorse Bob Stanley. The Sox ended April two and a half games back. They ended May two and a half games up and in sole possession of first place. But winning is never easy, and May took its toll. It was May 18th. The Sox were battling the Texas Rangers, and the battle was real. First with Bill Buckner, then with Rich Gettin, and finally, with Al Nipper. Nipper covering hole, the throw by Gedman he is out in Nipper is hurt. The Sox went on to win, but Al Nipper would be lost for more than a month. Two weeks later, against Minnesota, the man who was leading the league in strikeouts and having his best season ever went down. Bruce Hurst would be out of action until mid-July. Then, just two innings later, Sammy Stewart was hit and would make only three appearances until August. May had been Boston's best month, but it was a month that hurt the most. It was only early June, but the Sox were in a serious situation. They had beaten the Western clubs badly in April and May, but were only five and four against Eastern rivals. In June, they would face 29 straight days of play within their division, and all without the help of Hurst, Nipper, and Stewart. Manager McNamara turned to Rob Woodward, Mike Brown, and Jeff Sutters to make up the difference. I have uh, confidence in uh, Mike has more experience up here, but uh, Rob Woodward's makeup is very good. So is Jeff Sellers. They're all, all three of them very tough kids, very tough competitors, and with good ability. With the Sox in first place, it was us against them throughout the Eastern Division, and no one wanted to beat Boston more than the team from New York City. The Sox opened the huge three-game series against the second-place Yankees in New York on June 16th. Even with a three-and-a-half game My lead, right it was still well all on the line. And leaps up for the catch. It was no Taylor contest. The, the Sox had New York's field. number in all Major three games and returned to Boston score. with a six-game lead. Boston welcomed back its heroes 
and shared a special moment with Wade Boggs over the loss of his mother. On the 23rd, New York came to Boston for the rematch series. The Yankees took games one and two by margins of 11 to three and eight to one. The stage was set for game three and the return of Al Nipper. Chop slowly to Buckner, who will make the play to Nipper just in time. Boy, Nipper, get out of the way of those spikes. And that is rocked in the center field for a base hit. Armas charging. That will score a run. Yankees get one back. It's now five to three. Got it. Came right in on it. And Reneke is mad. Two strikes to Griffey. Got him. Off. Chasingly back. Buckner has it. Down it goes to Barrett. Barrett will throw down to Gedman for the out. And they got Ricky Henderson. Fly ball, center field, very deep. Lions back. Has room. Has the ball. This game's over. And the Red Sox save one and beat the Yankees in the final game. Boggs was back. Nipper was back. Sam Beto was back. And on June 29th, there was a new player added to the roster. I'm very pleased to be able to, to be here with the Red Sox. I know they have an excellent team, and I just only hope that I can get myself turned around and, and uh, help them. Um, I have very deep affection for John McNamara, and I have very deep affection for Bill Fisher. And uh, it's, uh, I look forward to working, as John McNamara says, not for them, but with them. With wins by Clemens, now 14-0, Boyd, and a young Jeff Sellers, the Sox closed out June with an important three-game sweep of arch-rival Baltimore, giving Boston an eight-game lead in the East and a 49-25 record for the season. What we did prove uh, during the first half of the season is that we can compete. Uh, everybody is waiting for us to, uh, to fall down, uh, especially when we broke on, uh, on top, got, to the, uh, got the lead on May 15th. Well, they haven't played the Yankees yet. They haven't played Baltimore yet. They haven't played Toronto yet. We played them, and we were successful. On July 1, the new man was on the mound. And with a little help from his friends, Tom Seaver did what he had done for years, win. It would be nice to say that the addition of Seaver brought instant stability to the Sox, but such was not the case. On July 2nd, Roger Clemens went for his 15th win in an ice-cold Fenway Park. He pitched well and played well until he faced George Bell. And this is going to be up into the screen and gone. Oil Can Boyd followed the next night, but he too followed in failure. High and way out of here to left field. 2-0 Toronto. Boxcars through. After taking two out of three from Seattle, Oakland was next, and again Clemens was hit with a loss as he tried for number 15 in the win column. Long toward left field, high and deep and gone. Two run homer, Jose. Canseco. Roger and the Red Sox and were losing. Oakland. Starters and stoppers alike were being hit hard by the opposition. Long drive, left field. Way back. 28 runs in the Toronto series, 17 with Seattle, 19 against Oakland, and 26 against California. The Sox had lost the ERA lead in the league, and they were losing to teams they had beaten before. It was only the big bats and a bag full of luck that was keeping the team on track. But Boston couldn't count on luck to last. Or could they? It was game one in the final series before the All-Star break. The score was tied at four against the, the Angels. In the 12th, California took a 7-4 lead. There were two out with a man on first when Jim Rice came to the plate. Rice with a high 
high drive to left field. Way up and into the neck for a two-run homer. It's now seven to six. And he slams it into right field. Baylor coming to the plate. Here comes the throw. Not in time. It's tied up. The ball gets away. It is backed up. Runners will be at second and third. Ray Canone is the batter. Runners at second and third. They call a ball. They called a balk. I don't know. Ball. Boone is awfully mad. He did. They must have. Yes, Red sir. Sox win it. A balk has been called, and Evans comes home. Another impossible win for Boston. It would be a while before California would forget, and the Sox would remind them one more time. It's never over till it's over. The Sox would remember the day as well for the All-Star selections. Jim Rice, Rich Gedman, and Wade Boggs had been chosen. John McNamara was picked to coach. But the most winning pitching tandem in the league would not be a tandem in the All-Star game. For the second year in a row, Dennis Boyd was not selected. Boyd lashed out with his frustration and was suspended from the club. And while Roger Clemens had an outstanding performance in the mid-season classic, pitching three perfect innings and winning the MVP award, Boyd's troubles and suspension continued. The can was not to play again in July, and that certainly was no help to the team as they continued to struggle. The Sox opened the second half of the season against Seattle and lost the series three games to one. Then Oakland swept for three, followed by the Angels, who took two more. With eight losses in their last ten starts, the Sox divisional lead was down to three games. In total, the entire month of July was a disaster. Not a single Boston starter had a winning record, and that included Roger Clemens, who ended the month with a loss of a game and an argument. Gonna be an argument here. Clemens has been kicked out of the game, has he? I think Roger Clemens has been ejected. The Sox opened August back at Fenway. Oil can Boyd was newly reactivated. Bruce Hurst and Al Nipper were healthy once again. Tom Seaver seemed strong, and Roger Clemens was still leading the league. For the first time in nearly three months, the Red Sox starting rotation was back in order. It was almost like the start of a new season, and appropriately enough, the first foe at Fenway in August was Kansas City. The Sox took the first game of the series, lost the second, and had game three on the line when manager McNamara took a chance on a new guy from the bullpen to relieve Al Nipper. Next into Fenway was Chicago, who took the first two games of the series by margins of 1-0 and 3-1. Again, Clemens and Boyd pitched well, but Boston was unable to generate enough runs to make it positive. With the division closing fast and the Sox lead now down to only two and a half, McNamara changed the lineup, moving Boggs into the leadoff position. The move seemed simple enough, and the results were immediate and impressive. Fly ball, left field, hit deep. Way back, and up, and gone. Home run, Marty Barrett. Do nothing, Boston. Hurst followed and won, then Seaver, then Nipper. It seemed that the pitching and hitting were finally in sync. And that indication was perhaps no more evident than in game three against Detroit on August 10th. With the Sox trailing six to five in the eighth, Rich Gedman stepped in to pinch hit for Mark Sullivan. 
Gedman goes deep toward right field. Line drive, grand slam, Rich Gedman. Red Sox take the lead as Getty comes up with a pinch hitter and slams one. McNamara then brought in Calvin Chiraldi to close. Strike three. Chiraldi was looking that better that and better. He got two more saves days later against Kansas City and then recorded his first official win back at Fenway, again against Detroit. Fly ball into the gloaming in right field, and Dwight Evans tracking it down. Red Sox win it. Nice job by Calvin Chiraldi. Yet even with the starting rotation in order and continued contributions from the bullpen, Boston was still only 10 and 7 for the month. They needed something more. So on August 18th, General Manager Lou Gorman made another move, picking up Dave Henderson and Spike Owen from Seattle. Within days, Spike Owen made his mark. Fly ball deep left field. Hall going back, For the day, still going Owen back. scored six runs, tying Sox great Johnny Pesky's Home major league Spike record. Owen, his first of the year. And the rest of the Boston lineup didn't do too badly either. In all, Boston scored 24 runs. It was the highest Sox single game production in 36 years. And yet, over the last 10 games of the month, Boston could only mark a 5-5 five and five record for a total of 17 wins against 13 losses in August. They were hitting well and pitching well, but not at the same time. The Sox were on again, off again, and Toronto, the Eastern Division winner in 85, was only three and a half games back. The Red Sox assignment for September was simple enough, win. They would play second place Toronto six times and third place New York seven. The players knew beyond all question that they and they alone would be the masters of their own destiny. We can hit the ball where there's no defensive guy out out there. We can't make too many mental mistakes. And if you don't make too many mental mistakes, you got a chance to win. If we continue getting the pitching that we have right now, and the hitting come around because we haven't had everyone hit at the same time. I hope eventually they will start doing that. We're going to win. For the pitching uh, with any team, that, that's really what takes you into the playoffs in the World Series is pitching, and, and they've done phenomenal this first half, and, and uh, they've just got to come out and do the same thing that they've done in the past, and, and if we continue to hit, we're going to win. The Texas Rangers were first into Fenway for a three-game stand. Three times the Rangers took a lead, and three times the Sox came from behind to win. Drive to left center field. It's going to be in there for a game. Minnesota was next, and again the Sox were behind. That is until captain Jim Rice led by example. He followed the next night with a game-tying single to set up a winning shot by Marty Barrett, and then for final measure he closed out the Twins and the series on the third night. It was his second Grand Slam in three days. Next was Baltimore, but the Birds could do no better than take one of four as Jim Rice and friends continued to put the ball out of play. Including Rice's two Grand Slams, the Sox had notched 16 home runs in the first 10 days of the month. But more importantly, they had won 11 in a row, three times with their last at-bats. Boston's 11 straight tied the Major League win mark for the year and put Boston eight and a half games up on the division. Next came New York, another win, and Bill Buckner's seventh home run in eight games, his 100th RBI for the season. They knew what they had to do. We were going into September, and Toronto had won nine in a row, and the pressure has been on us all season long, and I was very proud at that stage of the season that uh, everybody made a run at us, and we were able to uh, turn them all back. A sweep of Milwaukee and a big Clemens win in Toronto continued to close the gap on the Sox magic number. And then, finally, on September 28th, after 11 years of waiting, the chance for a championship came back to Boston. Steve here picked the best day to come to be with the rest of the great fans of Boston. See if Clint did. The Red Sox were ready. They had the power, which had come perfectly to peak in September. And they had a man on the mound who desperately wanted to win. It would be his chance for a career-high 16th win, his chance to redeem his Fenway opening day loss. 
his chance for a moment of glory in a most troubled season. The curveball dropped over for strike three. Number nine for Boyd. To left field, Jim Rice. Two out. A high pop-up. This may do it. Buckner is there. It's all over. The Red Sox are the new division champions. The Sox closed out the 1986 regular season on October 5th. They had won the division by five and a half games over the Yankees, with an overall record of 95 wins against 66 defeats. They were the Eastern Division champions of the American League. It was the culmination of a long and arduous season, but for the players, manager, and coaches, the 1986 regular season was only chapter one of a championship trilogy. Chapter two was at hand, and it would prove to be just as demanding for the men who were the Red Sox. It was to be the strength of the East against the best of the West. The Boston Red Sox versus the California Angels. Beyond all the theoretical comparisons and contrasts between the two clubs, the simple fact was it would be a best of seven series, the winner to go on, the loser to go home. Game one was a matchup of aces, Roger Clemens against Mike Witt. In the first inning, both faced the top of the opposing order and sent them back. But in the second inning, after picture-perfect strikeouts of Rob Wilfong and Dick Schofield, Clemens faced trouble. Roger had thrown 45 pitches to retire the side, far more than he had ever needed before. The score was 4-0 Angels. And while Clemens was being hit, the Red Sox remained hitless against Witt, inning Chopper after inning. Finally, with Owen on by a walk and Boggs on with the Sox Owen first hit, there second. was two on and two out when Marty Barrett came to the plate with Boston's first play. real chance. Here's the one-two pitch coming on from Witt. Drive to right field. Owen around third. The throw home, and he is safe at home. It was a start, but it was all that there would be. By the end, the Sox were defeated 8-1. to one. Clemens had thrown 94 strikes in 143 pitches, enough to strike out more than 30 batters, but not enough this night to beat Mike Witt, who was, in a word, unbeatable. It was a perfect day at Fenway. Autumn blue sky, temperature in the mid-60s, and Bruce Hurst was on the mound. Hurst would match up against Kurt McCaskill, a very good right-hander with a 9-3 record for the season's second half. Perhaps McCaskill was one of the best, perhaps not. But there was little question regarding the credentials of the Red Sox leadoff man for game two, and no question after a two and two count. McCaskill had seen the best batter of the regular season, and then he faced the man who would become the best batter for the postseason. It was Barrett's third hit in the series, and it gave Boston a 1-0 lead. Hurst of the Red Sox controlled the game, working calmly and carefully through innings and crises alike. And all the while, the second-best defensive team in the league tried to stop a relentless Boston attack. Hurst was as good as he could be. Jim Rice and the rest of the Red Sox batters provided the power to go with the pitching. By twilight's last stand, the score was 9-2, and the Sox had evened the series at one game apiece. Ground ball to Boggs, knocks it down, picks it up over the second, and the series is even.
East is East and West is West, but they met in Anaheim for ALC Game 3. Dennis Oilcan Boyd was on the mound for Boston, John Candelaria for California. Through the first inning, both men pitched as expected with fine control. In the second, Candelaria faced his first moment of truth. Jim Rice walked. Don Baylor struck his fourth hit of the series. After a pickoff play on Baylor, Dwight Evans singled to left. There were runners on first and third as Rich Gedman came to the plate. Boston held its slim one-run lead until the bottom of the fourth when the Angels tried to kick the can. Line to left field, base hit. Boyd throws. There's a dribbler going down the line. It hits the first base bag. The play at the plate. He's safe at home, and Gedman. Gedman doesn't like it. He goes at it with Tony. And now Gene Mark doesn't look very happy. Uh, let's see what's going to happen here. He's into it now with the umpires, and they're checking with Rich Garcia. Mark is fired up Much to the chagrin of the hometown of the crowd, the decision said, stood. Garcia the Angels, at the end of four, up. had no score and no manager. But the Angels came back in the sixth for one run, and then again in the seventh for even more. The Sox were down and Boyd was out, but Boston wasn't finished yet. In the eighth, they made their drive. Back goes Jones. It's by him. The pitch to Rich. Lines one in the left field. Jim Rice coming on, and Boston now trailing by one. The Sox came close, but not close Getting enough. Right as California field. got one more in the eighth, over. then and held the Sox scoreless in the last and inning for a it. final score of five to three. And now, California led the series two games to one. Game four was another night game at Anaheim. With the stadium's lighting rated as the best in baseball, the park was considered a hitter's dream. The hitter's nightmare, of course, was facing the speed of Roger Clemens or the chicanery of Don Sutton. Both men threw hard, soft, straight, and curved, every which way to beat the batters. Neither club was able to score or threaten until the top of the sixth. Bill Buckner came up with Tony Armas on third. Buckner swings and drills it down the line in right field. Fair ball and the Red Sox lead. By the ninth inning, Boston had given Clemens a three-run lead, and Roger, through eight complete innings, had given the Angels absolutely nothing. With the lead going into the ninth inning, the Sox had won 83 of 84 games during the regular season. There was no team in baseball with a better record. Three men up, three men down. That was all that was needed to tie the series. Into left field, Rice coming over, now going back, it's going over his head as he misjudged the ball. They're all running, Schofield rounding third, he'll come home, right at third, Pettis at second, the Angels get a big break on this one. This will blow them up. He got him swinging. Swing and a miss, strike two. Robin ready on the mound, checking into the sign. Down with a deep breath. Tension right here. The right hander throws and he hit him. And the game is tied. So Raleigh hit him on an it off had happened. pitch and it's The lead was gone. The game was tied. Now it was one inning at a time. Something, anything for one team while denying the other. And this game, this nerve-wracking, nerve-wrecking game would be over. The Sox came up in the 10th and were sent back. Giraldi settled and the Angels were put away. 
now the 11. Boston could do nothing. The Angels went on the attack. Shirelli faced the same challenge. Three up, three down. Hit hard to right field, base hit. Drilled into left field, a base hit. Here's the runner coming around third. And on to score, the Angels are up three games to one, and they can taste victory now. Game five will be played less than 16 hours from now. This will be a long, short night. A long, short Sox night indeed. And perhaps a very up. long winter for second thoughts and self-doubt about a game that got away. The only thing that we said is that uh, we want to put this uniform on tomorrow in Boston. And, uh, you know, in order to do that, we have to win. Perhaps it was just coincidence. Game five was to be played in the American League's Wild West at exactly high noon. And down three games to one, a long way from home, and again facing the seemingly unhittable Mike Witt, the Red Sox were left with no alternative except to play by the old gunslinger rule. Come out smoking. The pitch, line to right field, and it is gone for a home run. Witt almost had him. As quick as Boston was to get on the board in the second with one swing of the bat, California was just as quick with a single stroke in the third. The Sox behind Bruce Hurst held the lead through the fourth and the fifth. And then almost, almost through the sixth. Rich moving the bat back and forth. The pitch. There's a drive into center field deep. Henderson going back, back, back. And he touches it with his glove. It's gone. A home run. Another look at what may well live on in both California and Boston for a long time. A single play, and the game no longer belonged to Boston, but rather to the Angels. And California kept Chopped the momentum the for the Barrett next going inning as well. There and Owen, and it's going out into center field. White is waved in, swinging away to shallow center field. Henderson is on the move, and he has it. The throw off and the now line. And it was 5 2 California. 5 2, with only the eighth and ninth innings to somehow, some way, score and score again and again, just to tie just to stay in the game, just to stop California from winning and stealing the Boston dream. But Mike Witt cared nothing for Boston dreams as he continued his ice-cold dissection of Boston batter after Boston batter. And then, in the ninth inning, Don Baylor gave Boston a bit of inspiration, just as he had all year long. Big right-handed batter digging in. Here's the pitch, and there's a drive into left center field, and Pettis back to the wall, and it is gone for a home run. Baylor has brought the Sox to within one. It is five to four. Don Baylor keeping the Sox hopes alive in what could be their last inning of the 1986 season. Pitch Gedman at the plate. And uh, pitching coach Marcel Latchman on his way out to the mound to talk to Witt. And then and Lucas came in to pass. pitch to Gedman. Gary Lucas will come in to face Gedman with two out. California clinging to a 5 4 lead here. Boston trying to stay alive, and he is hit by the pitch. Rich Gedman hit by the pitch, and he is going down to first base, and Latchman comes out again to get Donnie Moore. Cool pitch to Dave Henderson. The first pitch is low for ball one. Strike in there. It's one and one. The Angels two strikes away from winning it all. The pitch is cut on a miss. Strike two. And there's a ball outside and low two and two to Dave. Angels one strike away from the World Series. Set delivers. There it goes, deep to left field. 
the ball hit hard. Down he back and it's gone. Dave Henderson has hit a home run. The Red Sox have taken the lead. This is unbelievable. He had given away two runs in the sixth inning. In the ninth, he took them back. In a single instant, Dave Henderson became a Red Sox player to be remembered forever. But there still remained one final task, and that was to close out the Angels in the bottom of the ninth, and California was not to go lightly. Safe, safe at home. Broken bat, and Crawford snares it, and we're going to the 10th. Neither team took the 10th. In the 11th, Boston Baylor took it all. Hit by the pitch. Evans up the middle into center field, base hit. The bunt popped up. Fair ball, and it's safe at first base. The sense a bare handing, but the throw into the air in left center field. Pettis under it. Baylor tags, and he scores. The Red Sox lead it 7 to 6. It was enough, just enough, a single run. After more than five hours of determined struggle, Boston had come back from the brink of elimination, and now California would have to come back to Boston for game six. Well, after coming back and winning uh, game five, we felt very confident that we can uh, we could go ahead in our own ballpark in front of our own fans and go ahead and, and uh, win those final two ball games. It was the same approach. We wanted to put the uniform on one more time. Oil Can Boyd was on the mound. And as all of Boston knew, the can would never, ever pitch a dull game. Boston was down two runs before they had even come to bat. But after Game 5's heroics, two runs was not much to ask. The Sox scored two runs without a hit. In inning three, they scored the old-fashioned way with one hit after another. Buckner drills it into center. He goes the other way. Rupert Jones over the field it. Holding Buckner, Rice going back over to second. Rich throws it by Wilford. It Buckner was power scores. without prevention. Boston scored three more runs to win the game 10 to 4 and even the series at three. They were not to be denied. It was a perfect night for baseball, a perfect matchup of pitching and power as the Red Sox and Roger Clemens went against the California Angels and John Candelaria in the deciding game of the American League Championships. But within the first four innings, the game became just a game. Candelaria thought, Clemens ripped into left field for a Ground ball hit slowly to second base. Burleson can only go to first. Baylor scores. Logs up the pitch. Ripped into center field. It hit the bag and it goes into right center. Baylor on the score. Evans scores. The runner's going and it's hit to left field. It may clear the wall and it, it does. Was perfect. Home run Jim Rice, runs. one of two remaining players from the 1975 team, still on the Red Sox roster had literally put the game out of reach for California. Just a big hit by Dwight Evans, the only player from the 75 series, could have made the night more perfect. In the seventh inning, the night became more perfect. Down the line, left field deep. Home run. And as Boston hit, California remained nearly hitless. First against Roger Clemens, and then against Calvin Chironi. He delivers. Swung on and missed. The Red Sox have won the pennant. After 11 years, after hundreds and hundreds and hundreds more ball games. 
the Red Sox had won the American League Championship. They had taken the first step of the trilogy and won. They had taken the second step and won again. Now, there remained only the final assault to the absolute pinnacle, the series. The series opened in New York at the Mets' Shea Stadium to bone-chilling cold and an equally icy reception by Mets fans. But the Red Hunt Sox quickly took a two-game lead with shutout pitching by Bruce Hurst and Calvin Chiraldi in Game 1 and a nine-run offensive effort in Game 2. Hurst and Chiraldi gave away only four hits to the Mets in the first encounter, and that was only one better than Mets starter Ron Darling. Three and two pitch inside ball four. Evans at the plate in the, the dirt. The difference was a catcher. simple play that didn't turn out to be so simple. Drilled at Tuple. It goes through his leg. Rice being waved in. Strawberry throws not in time and Rice is home. The Red Sox won Gets the game and in. led Sox the series one to zero. One. Game two was to be a no-hit showdown between Roger Clemens and Dwight Gooden. But the pitcher's duel became a hitter's duel as Boston hit Gooden hard and often. Another one to the opposite field base hit. Change up, hit into right field. The Mets came back in the third with two Straight runs of their own, but it would hit. be as close as they would get to matching the Boston attack. The Sox scored once more in the ninth, but more importantly, they had scored the first two wins of the series, and only once in history had a team come back to win after losing the first two at home. Fenway Park had a near carnival atmosphere as the Sox and the faithful were once again united for game three. But celebration plans for a Sox clean sweep ended early. In fact, with the very first visiting batter. The 1-1 one, one pitch. Hit down toward the pole and right. If it stays fair, it's gone. This one lined into short right center field for a base hit. And while the Mets and scored two more in the, the seventh Sox and another in the eighth, Hernandez the Sox were held to a single run by a pitcher they knew all too well, former teammate Bobby Ojeda. The message of game three was clear. There would be no clean sweep nor easy win. With a game still in hand and before the home crowd, manager McNamara held to a decision made prior to game three. He would start Al Nipper against Ron Darling in game four. For three innings, Nipper and Darling kept the game scoreless, but in the top of the fourth, the bottom fell away for Boston. This one high and deep to center, and it may clear the wall. Strawberry the other way, base hit into left field. Hit over Nipper into center, base hit. Evans to the wall, jumps, gets it, but no, it drops out, home run. In return, the Sox tallied two runs of their own, but it was too little too late, as the Mets closed out the game 6-2 to two and even the series. And now... It was the best of three. It was a pivotal game. The Sox couldn't afford a New York sweep and then face the Mets twice at Shea. New York didn't want to go one game down and be forced to win two in a row, particularly with a rested Roger Clemens scheduled for game six. Bruce Hurst was on the mound, and as he held the Mets scoreless through seven innings, the Sox did the damage they needed to do. Ball drilled into right center field. Strawberry. The pitch check swing up the middle. Fastball lined up the middle. The Long Boston the bats were Playoff. back. Buckner Two triples, a double, Henderson. ten hits, Ritson. and four Fair runs. The now corner. they would go to New York and needing only one of two, and Clemens Boston. would lead. Game six in New York was the hottest ticket in town. And for one young fellow, Getting there was half the fun, only in New York. But Boston was not to be distracted. They attacked first and tallied first. I drive into center field, heading for the wall, played by Dykstra. 
Off the wall as Boggs is coming. Line by bar to left base hit. Owen scoring. Boston took the lead but couldn't add to it as Ojeda began to match Clemens out for out, inning for inning. And then in the fifth, the tide turned against Boston. Throw down to Marty Barrett, and he's out. No, oh, they called him safe. Safe shot into center field, base hit. Strawberry rounding third and on the score. The pitch whacked into right field. Knight will hold at second as Evans bobbles. Now Knight is going on to third. Evans throws hard ground ball to Barrett over to second for one to first. Double play, but Knight scores and it's all tied up. The Mets had tied the game, but within two innings, Boston oh, faced a new Mets pitcher and another chance. Hit to third, Knight up with the ball, over to first. High throw away from Hernandez. Barrett going over to third. Like a routine play, got away from Ray Knight. The runner going, the sinker, hit on the ground to second. Safe at second, out at first, Barrett comes home. For the second time, the Sox had a lead. And for baseball's best pitcher, there were only nine outs to go. Direct to Evans. And he makes the play. Grounder to Barrett. Over to Buckner. Two out. The pitch. Out to Henderson. Six to go. Henderson reels it in. And the Mets are down on the seventh. It was the bottom of the eighth. The Mets' second last chance, and now they would face the showstopper, Calvin Chiraldi. Getting ready to work here. Fastball ripped through the hole at first. The tying run is on. Chiraldi delivers. Line drive left field. Rice making the catch. Mazzilli tags and scores. Dykes for the third, and it's all tied up. It was a rock tough not so friendly game between two veteran teams of hard driven players players who had ice in their eyes and fire down below one back to first double play Aguilera came in for the Mets three up three down Chirondi came back for Boston and held they went to the 10 the Mets would face Owen and Chirondi but first they would face Dave Henderson the Dave Henderson of Game 5 California fame. The man who was the hero in Anaheim at the plate. And there it goes. It is gone for a home run. He has done it again. Dave Henderson puts the Red Sox in a position to win. They got Owen and Chiraldi, but with two outs, the Mets still face the top of the order, the best in baseball. Wilson can't get there. Marty hits it into center field, base hit. Dykstra picks it up, running, and he throws home, safe at home. And now, there were just three outs to go with a two-run lead. Three outs. And the Boston Red Sox would be the world champions. On the outside end. for Carter and the time run to the plate. And it's lined in the center field, base hit. The pitch to Ray, base hit. Carter on the score. The time run to third, and Kevin Mitchell coming up for the Mets. John McNamara going out to the mound. And the pitch gets away from Gedman. The ball to the backstop. Mitchell comes in to tie the game. Ground ball to Buckner. It goes through his legs. Knight will score. What could have been, the Mets what should have, have been, was not. Whatever the outcome, the next game would be the last. A rain delay postponed the final game an additional day. In a small way, it worked to the Sox advantage as they were able to muster their attack behind the 3-0 postseason pitching of a rested and ready Bruce Hurst. New York countered as expected with Ron Darling.
It was a tentative first inning for both clubs, but in the second, there was nothing tentative about the Sox side of the inning. Boston was on top, and Hurst kept them there with shutout pitching through five innings. And then the Mets made their move. By the top of the eighth, the Red Sox were down by three, but not for very long. There was no more. Orozco shut down the Sox, and the Mets scored two more runs to win the game and the 1986 World Series. The trilogy had ended in tragedy. They had come so very far, but not far enough. Not far enough to rest the lifelong dreams of those who watched and waited. Not nearly far enough for those who had labored in apparent vain. There seemed to be no words of consolation. Yet somehow, we all found the words, the right words, and we shared them with those that had given us all they had, and it was more than enough. They were the 1986 Red Sox. They will be forever our champions. Very, very proud of. A team that experts predicted would finish no better than third or fourth in this season. American League champions, the Boston Red Sox, we love them. Let's hear it for them. I could not be any prouder of a ball club and my players than what they've showed us through the 1986 season. I don't know what to say other than thank you for your support, the fan support this year. This is the most tremendous event I've ever been involved in. Seeing all you people here today, you don't know what it means. This is the greatest thrill of the year, no question. Seeing you guys out here today hits us right here, and that's, that's no lie. This is the end of my 31st year of covering Major League Baseball, and I've never been around a finer team. I think that there's a sign out there I, I read on the way. The Mets think they're in heaven, but the Red Sox are going to be back in 87. We're, we're going to be back next year, believe me. Maybe next year or the year after, believe me, we're going to do it. Thank you. We can't wait to come back here next October. Let me tell you something else. They may have our trophy, but they can keep the Big Apple. We want it right here in Boston where it belongs. Now you can learn to take better pictures with these video cassettes from Kodak. For the serious amateur, step-by-step -step approaches to composition, lighting, lenses, filters, and film principles. For more advanced photographers,
on location tips from Kodak professionals. And for everyone, the best of Kodak's photo travel films. Over 20 programs available to you now from Kodak, the people who wrote the book on photography. Thank you.